So I'll hand it over. I just wanted to kind of make that segue because I saw it. <laughs> and then I'll hand it over to Mira though for the Great. So session. yeah, as Mike said, we're gonna this is the next step session. Um, so really going through discussion and alignment on the key actions and think goals and priorities um, and the different efforts that are already taking place. Um, as Tim C is winding down, making sure that we kind of have a home for everything. So Freddie, um, we have it over to you to give us updates on how Pulse Ox fits into the broader advocacy agenda with the Lancet Oxygen Commission. And thank you very much. Uh, greetings, colleagues. Uh, allow me to, to share my slides. As part of the Lancet Commission, we have uh, Karina King online, who is a co-chair, Liv, who spoke a few minutes ago. Then we are also joined by one of our commissioners, uh, Mike Lipnick. So what I'm presenting uh, basically highlights as far as pulse oximetry is concerned. And uh, it's really on behalf of, of, of the secretariat and uh, the commission. Uh, for purposes of clarity, the commission is made up of the executive committee. That's myself from Macquarie University, Leith from Every Breath Counts, Karina King from Makarinska Institute, and two other colleagues, Hamish from Australia and uh, Ahmed uh, from Bangladesh. And then, of course, the, the Lancet Global Health, the editor uh, that is supervising this work. We have commissioners, 20 of them, and Mike representing them here. Then an advisory group of 40, as some of you have actually participated in that. And then broadly, oxygen access collaborators who have been meeting once a month. In terms of goals, uh, the goals that uh, were conceived about one and a half years ago, one was to identify and address media evidence gaps as far as hypoxemia burden is concerned, oxygen access, oxygen solutions, and then uh, financing and political economy, and also identify areas that require additional inquiry. The second, to mobilize a broad coalition to promote uh, best practices, and then to contribute to accelerating investments and uh, impact towards uh, stronger health oxygen systems. Uh, probably at the end of this year, we shall look back and ask ourselves how much we've done so far. But in terms of the work that has been done so far, we hope that the report will basically summarize a number, the hypoxemia burden, globally, but also by different strata that needs oxygen. Uh, we have estimates that are undergoing review. And then we also hope that out of that, we'll be able to determine the proportion that reach a health facility and have for a certain proportion of those who need oxygen that reach a health facility. And then among those who reach the health facility, again, we hope to provide estimates on the proportion that actually reaches an oxygen-ready health facility. So a facility that is able to meet their oxygen needs. And then among those, again, a step further to identify the proportion that receives medical oxygen. And uh, lastly, the proportion that receives quality uh, oxygen therapy. And again, the, the proportions get smaller because of the multiple barriers along the way, including electricity, pulse oximetry use, availability of oxygen, and so on and so forth. The next couple of slides I'll share are basically the key advocacy messages that have emerged from the work so far. The first is that pulse oximetry is an underutilized essential medical intervention. And this is based on work by Work Package 2, led by Hamish. According to the estimates, availability in acute ward areas in health facilities is quite low. So by level, primary care, level one, level two, general district hospitals, and then level three, the tertiary facilities. So we see that at primary level, availability has been estimated at about 11%. So one in 10 health facilities has uh, pulse oximeters. But that's from 26 studies. Of course, a lot of this is again biased by studies from places that are actively doing this work. So health facilities and uh, contexts that are supported by PATH, which I and so on and so forth. So we need to keep that in mind. 
which basically means this might actually be an overestimate of, of, their, of their availability. Uh, level two is about 50%, uh, so 53% have uh, pulse oximeters from, again, a bigger number of studies. And then at tertiary level, availability is much higher as, as expected, about 84% with uh, a confidence interval of 80 to 87. Uh, however, within this availability, there are still the use of factors that uh, explain inequity. For instance, oximeter availability is three times lower in rural versus urban health facilities, but also it's lower in public uh, facilities, facilities funded by government versus uh, private facilities. And then also oximeter avail availability is lower in pediatric and general wards versus the higher oxygen acuity areas, emergence operating theaters and ICU, as, as expected. Uh, and then oximeter availability is also lowest again in sub-Saharan Africa and uh, big gaps generally. So in all low and middle income countries, the gaps still remain, although the, the biggest is in sub-Saharan Africa. So this is about availability. The team has also estimated coverage. So basically the actual use of pulse oximeters in patients. And we see the similar trend. Our coverage at primary care is low, about 6%, although this is again an estimate from very few studies, three. And uh, pulse oximeter generally is very available, as we saw in the, the previous slide, uh, but even when it's available, it's, it's rarely uh, used. Mm -hmm. And then at general hospitals, the coverage uh, increases to about 20%. Uh, there are more studies uh, for this estimate. And then at tertiary level, again, coverage goes up to 60%. But it's still low because at some of these levels, we'd expect a closer to 100% coverage. Again, there's inequity in, this, in these estimates. Our oximeter use is lower in pediatric and general wards versus emergency operating theaters and ICU wards. And then availability and coverage is still lowest in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the other message uh, that uh, we, we hope the report can put out is oxygen saturation measurement should be a vital sign. So it should be one of the signs used for screening patients, uh, particularly in primary care. The higher levels, as we see, the availability and coverage is much higher, but we think that it should be made routine, a vital sign alongside the current uh, uh, vital signs. Of course, there are numbers thrown that have been discussed fifth, sixth, seventh, but also when you search the literature, there's a case for pain assessment and also walking speed among the elderly patients and so on. However, the message really is that uh, oxygen saturation by pulse oximeter should be a vital sign, particularly in uh, places where there is limited uh, health infrastructure. Because as we've discussed, it is self, it is easy to use, and does not require advanced health infrastructure. Uh, the other method, the other message is uh, pulse oximetry is cool, is key to good oxygen care and improved outcomes. It uh, basically uh, uh, predicts oxygen uh, coverage. Uh, at primary level uh, from the team, again led by Hemish, there's no data uh, in terms of, of uh, how pulse oximeter contributes to oxygen coverage. Uh, however, at, at level two, uh, we have uh, uh, about 43% oxygen coverage, particularly for hypoxemic patients. So out of 10, about four patients uh, who are hypoxemic uh, get uh, the oxygen they require. And then at level three, uh, the, the coverage for oxygen therapy goes up to 80%. But as we can see, the number of studies are few. So there is need uh, to either do a bit more with the routine data that we have or conduct additional studies to understand this. However, the quality of oxygen therapy is lower. So when you get into the detail of this oxygen coverage, you note a number of additional findings. One is this delayed or missed recognition, particularly because of lack of routine pulse oximetry. And then there's also interrupted care. So some patients are started on oxygen and then suddenly 
uh, it's, it, it, it's it's stopped uh, for many reasons, partly because of lack of monitoring, continuous monitoring. And then there's also unnecessary and excessive use. Uh, again, largely because of poor use of pulse oximetry or basically non-availability of, of these tools. Uh, additionally, uh, uh, the report will highlight uh, additional findings. Uh, pulse oximeters, for instance, improve cost-effectiveness of the national medical oxygen systems. And this is based on uh, a national level ACID model that uh, used the work that has been done in Malawi by a team at Tanzi Laonze. Uh, and it looked at the different scenarios uh, by altering the coverage of pulse oximeter to see which is the best uh, path to, to invest to increase oxygen coverage. And one of the findings is that when you increase pulse oximetry coverage to 100%, then uh, cost effectiveness of all the other interventions to increase access to medical oxygen uh, is realized. And then pulse oximeter should be of good quality. I think we've had a lot of discussions on that with minimum field performance standards for all patients, regardless of skin pigmentation, age, severity of illness, and all the other variables. Regulatory agencies should follow the example of ESFDA in terms of uh, updating uh, their guidelines with the findings that are emerging from teams uh, like uh, Mike Lipniks and, and others. But also it's imperative to avoid and crowd out the market poor performing in, uh, and in accurate pulse oximeters, even though they may be of a lower cost. Uh, and I think from, from our review of literature, yeah, the biggest concern of the health workers is the reliability of, of the pulse oximeters. We've not found uh, any, any evidence that they don't want the pulse oximeter. The issues are about its durability, its lack of reliability, and then maintenance and uh, power-related issues. And lastly, uh, pulse oximeters should be available at all levels of the health system. As we mentioned, there should be routine as vital signs at primary care and made available. They should be part of the essential medicines device list, essential medical device lists at all levels. So WHO usually produces a model list and then countries adapt and sometimes our facilities also adapt their own list. So we think that oximeters should be part of those. Relevant international and national guidelines and healthcare packages for children and adults should support universal access to pulse oximetry. And then pulse oximetry should be covered by national universal health coverage and insurance schemes. So this is the highlights as far as pulse oximeter is concerned from the report. And again, uh, we have uh, Karina and Leith, uh, who are a part of uh, us in the kitchen uh, looking at this and the report is under review. Uh, this is the current timeline, and uh, as you see, we've basically uh, passed the middle of reached June 2024, where the report should basically be submitted to the Lancet uh, for yeah, a review and a editorial. And uh, the team is working very hard to keep to those timelines. It is expected to be published later this year, early Jan, according to the timeline and then launched uh, the first quarter of next year, uh, February, and uh, the team led by Leith is working on that. Uh, uh, thank you, and uh, uh, I'll be happy to provide additional clarification, but also Leith and Karina are here, and Mike, uh, to add uh, more flesh to these messages. Thanks, Freddie. Um, any comments from any of the other Lancet Commission representatives in the room? No major comments from me. I, you know, I, <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, um, we said that we're looking at US FDA, also ISO um, for standards updates to improve performance. Great. Um, Leith has no additional comments. Um, and Bob says, thanks for the marvelous presentation. <laughs> yeah, I have a uh, comment. Yes, go ahead, Angelo. Yeah, thank you for a nice uh, presentation and very enlightening. Um, I think one of uh, our issues also to emphasize is also on um, training. And uh, particularly, um, the way you mentioned is a very easy you know, tool to use. 
So sometimes within facilities, there is a task shifting. And uh, to that extent, you require people to constantly know when the waveform is the right one to take a reading. Because I think um, um, someone mentioned about even 70 or even below could be some of the issues that uh, are being experienced because often those who are taking the measurement may not be taking them correctly. So uh, retraining, mentoring people, on-job training as the availability is um, made possible uh, should be also a key component. Uh, over. Thanks, Andolo. Mm -hmm. Lots of lessons that we've learned through Timothy, I think Andolo is pointing to there. Um, Great, so maybe in, um, given the time, if anyone has any other comments, they can put them in the chat, but maybe we'll hand over to Pablo. Welcome back into the room virtually. Um, yeah. And if you wanna give us an update on the goal. Yeah, thank you. I, I know that you know a lot about goal, but I'm gonna share like the screen and go through very quickly, but I cannot share. So I, Freddy? Not sharing your screen. No, there we go. Okay. Are you seeing this, right? Looks good. Okay. So uh, I know that you are very familiar with the Alliance and the Alliance uh, was born after the evolution of the Act A. Uh, we, of course, cannot forget all the advance that happened during the Act A, the o Oxygen Emergency Task Force, in which over more than 120 countries received technical and operational support in which of these, of course, the partners were many. The Global Fund was a big procurer, but also we need to highlight the importance that Unitate had at the beginning of the pandemic as a catalyzer and also leverage the opportunities of we had been working before in the oxygen space with the Team C project to be very concrete and also with the project from Alima that we were able to do some work at the early days of the pandemic, also leveraging the experience and also the work that we were doing with other grantees as Chai, PSI and also uh, uh, partners in health and all of those were our initial work during the pandemic but of course then when the pandemic was more into uh, when other also partners were into uh, the, the field they were able to do a lot of work during the pandemic. So this emergency task force last year then evolved to the Global Oxygen Alliance that we need to see this and how to sustain the investments and all the work that happened during the pandemic. So all the capital investment that happened, how can we make it more implementable? Also working product specific, for example, pulse oximetry that I know that that's what we're talking to here today and how this particular device is embedded within the whole oxygen ecosystem, that it's something that also in Unite and in particular the Alliance were looking for. So maybe not only to invest in specific products, but of course, making sure that the quality assured products as the post oximeters are also included into the oxygen ecosystem that countries are preparing. Also, we need to be, the, the Alliance was born from working in a crisis mode, something that is more mature, inclusive and planned. And that's some of the work that it has been happen has been happening for the last uh, year. So from the COVID-19, then how to make roadmaps that of course include pulse oximeters. I know that you're aware that uh, two weeks ago, it happened, the, it happens the roadmap meeting in Senegal that I know that Pat was present with Lisa and I think other partners from countries were, were there in how to different components of the oxygen ecosystems are part of these roadmaps. And of course, post oximetry is very relevant in these documents as well. And then how to keep pushing for oxygen to be in the political agenda, also moving away from this crisis mode. So with this in mind, uh, the Alliance and the partners that conform the Alliance uh, have a, a realized of different access a barriers and not only access barriers, but the different challenges that countries faces to get the right uh, to have the, the a robust oxygen ecosystem. So of course we need to recognize the shortage of trained workforce, the weak maintenance and availability of infrastructure and delivery system. So in this case also is where, for example, the availability of devices as pulse oximetry falls, the lack of financing 
and this is something that also I, I, I'm pretty sure that in the TMC project you're more familiar that it's still a gap in knowledge in how to make the maintenance for the pulse oximetry, who are the main procurers, because it's a device that is very easy that to be neglected within the health facilities, the limited policy and planning ability in regulatory frameworks, that is something also needs to tap in the discussion that you were having about quality assurance products, for example, for pulse oximetry, the absence of different uh, monitoring indicators, the fragmented market that, of course, for not only for oxygen as the medicine, but also for devices at the pulse oximetry is also a reality. And of course, the lack of community engagement and there's a lot of variability in terms of governance and ownership of the oxygen ecosystem across different countries and regions. So with this in mind, the Alliance is planning, and this was launched last year with the executive summary that was launched September last year in the context of the UN General Assembly for different working groups that are working to try to uh, overpass the challenges that I just mentioned. So one working group is working in investment and consolidation and sustainability. This has to do with all the investment that happened during COVID that were more than $1 billion. Not all that money is spent yet, but we, we are expecting that it's going to be spent until the end of next year because much of the pot of that money, it's coming from the Global Fund and their COVID-19 response mechanism. Then the innovative supply chain and market shaping that also is a work that in unit is particularly leading this working group and where pieces of the oxygen ecosystem, for example, post oximetry might fall country planning and implementation, that it's all the work that is being worked towards uh, supporting countries to develop the roadmaps. And that was the initial milestone that happened two weeks ago with the roadmap meeting, but there are different milestones that's going to be delivered in the next 12 months based on that initial work that actually was kicked off last year, but it was a very important milestone to bring more than 62 member states for LMICs to work in this uh, template to have a costed roadmap of oxygen. And of course, advocacy and demand generation that is very important to keep oxygen ecosystem in the political agenda. So the governance, uh, it's very simple. We have for two years as co-chairs Unitate and the Global Fund and vice chairs African CDC and the PAHO, the idea that after two years, they're gonna to rotate. There are different working groups with different governance that are part of the, of the membership that I'm gonna mention very short in the next slide. And the secretariat is being run by UNICEF, UNITAID and the World Health Organization. So this is the current membership. So of course we have uh, different partners, PAD is one of them, but other partners that have been working in Oxygen for the last years, Every Bird Coalition, Access to Medicine Foundation, African CDC, the Gates Foundation, CHAI, et cetera, PAHO of course, and other different donors like the World Bank, USAID, UNICEF, UNOPS, et cetera, that are also part of the, of the, the Alliance and also affected communities delegation and NGOs we're still, of course, working towards and how to engage better with civil society. And of course, we cannot neglect the fact that we need to engage better with the private sector. And it's a work that it's ongoing. In this case, in particular, being led by the Access to Medicine Foundation that is trying to set up some of the ways that we can engage better with the private sector. So the, the, the goal is very... Um, uh, ambitious. So what the, the strategy of goal set up last year is to fundraise $4 billion until 2030. So in line with the SDGs and what we're doing this year and what might be useful for you to know that a, a goal is working in develop a full strategy that it's been commissioned by UNITE, but also with the other partners that are also working on that. We're hoping to start with this, developing this strategy, hopefully in the, during the summer or maybe in the next four weeks. And we want to have some initial drafts, hopefully at the beginning of fall. So it's going to be published hopefully before the end of the year. Along with this strategy, also we are developing an investment case of how much it costs to have a, a reliable and of course a sustainable oxygen ecosystem in a country. So we can also acknowledge the need of funding. And 
with the information that also will come out from the Lancet Commission that they have they will establish a gap of the oxygen ecosystem, we will be able to present this and have a, as a very relevant input for the roadmaps that the countries will start preparing with the support of WHO as well. So that is what's happening with gold this year. So we will have this full strategy and the investment case that of course pulse oximeter is very, very relevant to have this into the roadmaps that the countries and WHO are preparing. And in gold, even though it's not a donor, the value of gold is that all the partners that are working in oxygen are there. So of course, UNITED is doing its part, but at the same time, we need to acknowledge that many other partners are doing their part and everyone is trying to do whatever they do better. So in UNITED, and also for you to know, we're going to have hopefully a new area of intervention in oxygen. It might not be very specific in terms of we're going to invest in pulse oximeter in specific, but more something more holistic about the oxygen ecosystem. But of course, when we talk about that, pulse oximeter will be embedded into that. And the other partners, of course, they will be doing their part as well. Um, so that's what it's gold. I don't know why I know I know that you're very familiar with it, but that's what we have next and in the next coming months. So over to you in the room if you have any questions or in the chat. Thanks, Pablo. I do not see any questions in the chat yet. Um, any comments or questions in the room? If not, um, Pablo, I may ask you to just monitor the chat a little bit and see if anything comes up. Um, but we have Fifi on the line. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, Fifi from UCSF, um, who's going to give us the goals and priorities for the Open Oximetry Collaborative Community. Um, thanks, Mira. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for the opportunity to share about the Open Ox Collaborative Community today. Uh, my name is Fifi Naguse. I'm a program manager at the Center for Health Equity and Surgery and Anesthesia at the University of California in San Francisco. Uh, all right, so the OpenOx Collaborative community was launched at the end of 2022 and became an official FDA collaborating community in 2023. Um, the community has over 220 individual members representing over 18 countries um, and stakeholders with a wide range of expertise and industries. Um, we have held um, 12 meetings um, to date. Um, with two hybrid workshops. Um, and the primary goal of the collaborative community is to identify and address challenges um, with oximeters by facilitating data sharing, advocacy um, to improve best practices and standards, um, and advance innovation, safety, and equity. Um, in addition to the individual members, we also have institutional members, some of which are represented here um, and range from professional organizations to academic affiliated institutions and device manufacturers, uh, bringing uh, diverse perspectives to the work of the collaborative community and ultimately all working um, towards health equity in this space. Um, as of last month, I also wanted to highlight that we are happy to welcome our newest institutional member, which is the West African Public Health Institute. Um, the collaborative community uh, primarily functions through working groups, um, which are currently split into four. Uh, the subgroups meet on average on a quarterly basis um, to share progress, um, to strategize, and we try to also meet as a larger um, community once or twice a year. Um, so we have the clinical trial subgroup, um, education and communication, skin color diversity, um, and data sharing, and I'll discuss each of them in the following slides. Um, the clinical trial subgroup, um, so this was one of the, the first um, subgroups of the collaborative community. It focuses on developing uh, pulse oximetry study protocols. So we currently have like six available on our website. Um, and the goal of developing and sharing these protocols is to harmonize data collection across uh, various clinical trials um, that are ongoing or being planned across different institutions. Um, so the, when the subgroup meets, we troubleshoot any challenges, share resources, and make sure that data are aligned. Um, and this allows us to generate a larger data set, um, which can help answer the complex questions around performance bias. Um, currently, we have um, around eight different research groups conducting trials um, that are members of the subgroup. Um, and we really want to acknowledge their contributions um, of those teams. Um, so Rush University, UCLA, Johns Hopkins and based in South Africa, Highland Hospital in California, Mount Sinai, Stanford University and Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt University are some, uh, some of the, the members currently um, conducting studies. 
Um, so most of these clinical trials are still ongoing. Um, and in terms of next steps, we will continue to provide support to these studies uh, while we wait for data collection to be completed. Um, each of these studies has a different timeline. Um, and the hope is to share the analyses and raw data with um, researchers in the, in the following months. Uh, next, we have the education and communication subgroup. So this is one of the newest subgroups of the community. Um, it was just launched earlier this year, uh, but it's already making a ton of progress on the objectives, which are to communicate best practices for safe oximeter use um, and develop educational materials that are locally relevant and easy to understand. Um, so the group is doing this by developing a living infographic um, that communicates optimal use of oximeters, best practices for decision making, known limitations of these devices, as well as highlighting care and handling of these devices. Um, and one of the main goals of this group is to ensure that the content of the infographic, um, the language that's being used, and the method of delivery are all digestible um, and can be tailored to local needs. Um, so this means that the infographic will allow clinicians and other users to build their own educational posters um, and it uses a modular layout so people can select um, components um, that fit their own settings and their own needs. Um, so what you're seeing in the slide um, is a mock-up of what will be available on our website um, and any user can come on and select how to build their own locally relevant poster um, using the content and the graphics that have already been developed uh, by the subgroup. Um, the content will also be, uh, we're hoping to continually update it as new data come out um, just to keep everything up to date. Um, so over the next uh, couple of months, um, the subgroup will finalize um, and release the infographic, and the aim is to publish version one um, in June, so stay tuned for that. Um, and also, um, just to mention that uh, we're planning to make sure that the content is available in several languages. Um, so the third subgroup of the collaborative community is the skin color diversity subgroup. Um, and so this group has brought together experts and stakeholders um, to assess best methods for measuring and quantifying skin color, uh, both objectively and subjectively um, to inform regulatory standards. Uh, one of the main aims of this group is to better understand how subjective scales and objective scales relate to each other. So what categories or cutoffs um, should be used in both to accurately represent um, the world's population and also to ensure some level of alignment between these two, two methods of uh, measurement. Um, in terms of next steps for this subgroup, um, the processes and work, we, uh, while we were um, working on this, we realized that it would be beneficial to compile and curate um, the resources that we were finding along the way in terms of uh, diversifying research as well as the lessons we've learned um, so it could be available um, to others um, in an easy to access and curated format. Um, and so this has led to the development of a diversity toolkit for medical device researchers. Um, so uh, what you see on the slide is the toolkit on our website, which will be released in the next couple of months um, and can serve as a guide for medical device researchers on best practices on quantifying skin color as well as diversifying research. Um, and this includes race, ethnicity, skin color, among other met metrics of uh, diversity. Um, we uh, So the diversity toolkit will have a curated list of top 10 resources um, that will serve as a good starting point for any researcher. We'll have a frequently asked um, questions section um, that will be continually updated, um, a skin color protocol that summarizes how and when to measure skin color, um, as well as some uh, key terminology um, that are critical for conducting research um, equitably in a diverse setting. Um, so, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, we expect um, the diversity toolkit to be available or version one of it on our website in the next couple of months, and we will share uh, with the community for additional feedback. Um, so in addition to the diversity toolkit, um, some of me the members of the subgroup have also been working on a study um, to characterize skin color in order to add more representative data on the full range of human skin color, um, which has been missing from previous studies. Um, so we plan to use multiple devices, so um, high cost, so those are some of the devices you see on the slide, um, high cost devices as well as lower cost devices, um, and we'll also use subjective uh, measures um, to inform comparability across different measures um, for future studies. Um, in the next couple of weeks, actually, um, some of our colleagues from Uganda uh, will be coming to San Francisco to train on how to use um, these devices and hopefully uh, begin collecting data um, in Uganda sometime this year. 
Um, additionally, in terms of uh, diversifying pulse oximetry data for research and development, we're also um, working to explore the possibility of building a medical device uh, testing capacity in East Africa, um, so a laboratory, uh, and have been collaborating with stakeholders to assess feasibility um, over the last few months. Uh, so we believe the expansion would allow for more diverse data collection that is representative of the full spectrum of human skin colors, um, which is now limited uh, because, as you know, most device testing laboratories are located in countries with uh, predominantly light skin populations. Um, so we think this project could make, make a huge impact um, in the equity of device manufacturing. Um, yeah, so the last subgroup we have is the data sharing subgroup, um, and the primary goal of the subgroup is to build um, an open source data repository to bring together all of the lab and clinical oximeter data collected across different research projects. Um, so the hope is that this can accelerate progress in understanding and addressing performance bias uh, by creating a large enough data set to help answer some of the questions. Um, the work has mostly focused on standardizing definitions and structures of data uh, by leveraging the standardized protocols um, from the cl clinical trial subgroup that I mentioned earlier. Um, so the data repository um, has been completed and is available on our website, which is what you see here. Um, users can contribute to the repository from their own studies, uh, browse the data, or download um, to conduct their own analyses. Uh, in terms of next steps, uh, we're now working with various teams to submit um, data into the repository. And our goal is that different stakeholders can simultaneously work on answering the questions with a much larger data set um, than we've ever had before. Um, and in the coming weeks, we'll also plan to publish uh, a manuscript outlining the methodology of the work uh, for creating the data repository. Um, so overall, next steps for the collaborative community um, uh, we'll continue to uh, convene on a quarterly basis. Um, the different subgroups um, and the uh, objectives that I mentioned will be continued on. Uh, we'll also uh, plan to have a larger OpenOx Collaborative meeting um, in August. Um, so more information on that will be posted on our website. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, if you aren't already a member of the OpenOx Collaborative community and are interested in joining and supporting the work, um, you can visit our website, so OpenOx symmetry.org um, and go to our community page, or you can scan the QR code um, to sign up. Um, and uh, really, we're just grateful to all of our collaborators, members, and our sponsors who have made all of this work um, possible. Um, so thank you all very much for the opportunity to share. Um, if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you, Fifi. Lots of very exciting things to come um, in the next coming weeks, even. Um, any questions yes. from the group online or in person? Mike, anything to add? No, thanks, Fifi, for presenting. I think she covered it well. Um, we have some silence. It was very well covered. So maybe we'll just hand over to closing remarks. Mike. I think that's you. Okay, good. It's been a long day. But thanks to those who've made it through this whole day online and in person. Um, I think we've covered, so this morning, for those who were here, I promised that we would have, we would, we would cover some objectives and we had some ideal outcomes that we would, uh, that we would achieve. So uh, going through those, we said we would improve awareness and identify opportunities for collaboration. I think awareness has been improved. Hopefully we've at least made some links for opportunities for collaboration. We uh, agree on the best way to keep information flowing between partners. I don't know if we've agreed on anything, but I think uh, we've started some potential connections. Uh, partners are aware of useful tools and information repositories. Uh, so the Open Oximetry website is a clear one. Uh, we have also, some information from ISO and FDA that they'll be coming out with reg, uh, recommendations from FDA at the end of the year, ISO probably a year from now. There's other websites like the Med Device from WHO. And identify actions to improve access to quality devices in LMIC. We have some ideas. Um, there's still some questions out there in terms of what the Final recommendations will be because there's a lot of work to be done still. And then identifying next steps, which is what we just had a great session on uh, where this will go. So <clears throat> just 
kind of, I've been taking some notes over the course of the day to just try to summarize some of the key points. Uh, and so what I heard, no question, pulse oximetry is a critical tool for clinical care. Uh, there are the technical aspects behind the discrepancies, discrepancies uh, when used on patients with dark skin are complex. Um, I did hear that accuracy is better with high perfusion, but there are many aspects that affect perfusion. And Mike, you can correct me in the notes or right now if you want, anything wrong. Um, and work continues to identify those root causes to inform the recommendations because it is more complex than just one issue. Uh, we also heard very clearly that there's a lot of reliance on the US FDA uh, and from on standards from ISO, uh, other SRAs as well, but those two seem to be fairly uh, pretty important. Uh, FDA is working on guidance, ISO is working on standards. We can expect those hopefully again, FDA at the end of the year, we can provide comments, ISO probably within a year. Um, we had some recommendations on Trying to become, trying to advocate with ISO to be more inclusive or to get more inclusion from low and middle income countries. I think that's a nice uh, action item. Um, and then there's a clear role for this clear, for the collaborative community to create consensus. And I think Mike, you had a few items added to your to do list during this meeting. Uh, and then the WHO clearly for beyond the the technical specifications or engineering specifications, there's the clinical piece that the WHO and other clinical guidelines like the Ministry of Ministries of Health will need to fill gaps in terms of training and then what to do with the devices. So um, yeah, and, and then in terms of next steps, TIMSI is wrapping up. Uh, we will continue to be around, but in terms of as a project, we're closing, but Thankfully, we had a nice session just now on the ongoing activities from the Lancet Commission. Thank you. The goal, uh, what do we call it, the co coalition, and the uh, open and the open oxygen work. So the work continues, and uh, we're all here to, to support as long as we can. And, uh, I will give maybe the last word to well, Mike, and then we'll give it to Matt. <laughs> Mike, can you? I think you summed it up well. Um, clearly a lot more work to be done here. We're excited to work with uh, what is almost certainly gonna be a lot of different partners to try and get all this done. Um, thank you to PATH and Unitate for uh, supporting this meeting and the project. And we look forward to um, continuing to work with everybody in the collaborative community. So thanks for taking the time to join today. Thank you. I don't think I really need to say much. Um, I think uh, it's, it, I've, I've personally really appreciated being here and uh, learning so much today. And I know Tanya and uh, Pablo would share that with me. And um, we, though the Timsey project is wrapped up, we certainly, as an organization, intend to be fully engaged in um, the the work that's being done. Maybe more through the goal space uh in future so it was good that uh pablo got to talk about that and we'd encourage um we're, well I, I know pablo's definitely going to stay uh very much close in contact and, and i think we'll get plenty of opportunities about that in the future but um as always amazed by all the hard work that's going on um was great to understand a bit more about uh what's happening in fda and iso thank you so much uh for the presentations and the openness and the humor um and also uh pleased to hear from uh the timsey team in in kenya glad that uh we, we we've managed to achieve so much looking forward to attending the workshop next week remotely i'm afraid but uh looking forward to speaking to you there and uh it was a real pleasure and, and um we certainly are open to uh, uh, making sure we can um, see what we can do in different spaces. And so I'll, I'll be may, maybe following up with people for conversations and to link them up to various uh, people and, and sections of the Unitate office. So big congratulations to everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Yeah, and we'll be sharing notes. And if you need anything, you can reach out to 
probably the one Tim of the, C team. The Tim C team, and we can connect you with anybody who's on the meeting. So, and thank you, Andrew Loves, for yeah, made things very easy for all of us. Okay, and with that, we'll say thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay.